When did you start school? 1936. It was the same year, you see, same time when it started off with Austria. Parallel to that, I was t uh, talking about the Bible reading, and it is so much different from what the uh, Catholic taught, you know, in a, their priest taught. So the children would get at me, and they would call me dirty Jew. Because there was no worse way, you know, to express hatred than to use that expression, dirty Jew. But it did not have, uh, uh, it didn't crush on me. It made me proud, because for me, the Jews were God's people, Abraham's seed. And I thought it was an honor to be compared to a Jew. So I never felt this as being a load on me, you see. Before your parents began to convert to Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses, had you ever known a Jehovah's Witness? Had you ever no. seen Bible Forshers? No, or? no, no. We practically were the, uh, well, there was a group of about 40 for a whole department, you know. And my mother got three booklets from one of Jehovah's Witnesses who traveled to the country came, coming from Switzerland. And she never saw him again afterwards, you know, after they did their own Bible studies until they found the group. So they found the group. I was about eight years old or nine when we got to get to some meetings of other witnesses there. And by this time, we had a very clear understanding of what would happen to us when the German would take over, you see. So we expected it, and we got ready for that. Now, what does that mean? Well, we knew that the Germans had put a ban on Jehovah Witnesses in Germany. You could get arrested if you had a single little booklet of Jehovah Witnesses, you go to camp. When you had the Elberfeld Bible, which has the name Jehovah in there, they called this a Jewish Bible, the person who had that Bible could be arrested with no trial whatsoever. Did you witness any, anybody, did you see anybody who, who was arrested in your town? Well, time? my own parents. Before then? Before no, but the, he was the first one. My father was the first one to be arrested. And the other ones, uh, well, I wasn't there when they were arrested, you know. In, in the same week, uh, five of them got arrested, you know. It was a quick act from the Gestapo. But uh, the French government put Jehovah Witnesses on ban before the Germans came. And the police said, you move out of your hall and you take everything away. Uh, if you don't do it, we have to do it in two, three days' time. So they gave us freedom to move our things ourselves, you see. They were soft on us, they were good-hearted. But from that day on, we went underground. We had our meetings underground, and we got our watchtowers and the material to study the Bible underground. And my father organized this underground work over the border. And with my parents, I did go once in a while on that underground part to get material to come over the border. French material had to be translated into German and copied and sent to Germany. So as soon as the Germans came there, we were already organized. Now, when do, as soon as the, friend, as the German came into France, So, it's the 4th September 1941, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the bell rang. It was a time my father would come home from work. Usually my mother had the door open. And I said to my mother, hi, you didn't unlock the door? And I jumped, you know, toward the door, opened the door, jumped on my father's neck to kiss him, and suddenly behind him, somebody said, Heil Hitler. And when I looked on the man I had kissed, it was a Gestapo. I fell down on my feet, 
icy cold, you know. Pushed me aside and said, where is your mother? I said, she's here. You go in your room. So I went in my room and I said, how does that man know I have a personal room? Many children, when they are small, share rooms, you know, especially in those days. I said, funny. Saw the head mother on a cross examination for four hours. They wanted to get the names of all the witnesses and they wanted to get to know the underground activity, which I mentioned before, you see. I was sitting in my room and then suddenly I saw on the shelf the Elberfeld Bible with the name Jehovah. And I said, ah. Oh, we are going to get arrested if they find this Bible. So I went up and said to my mother, I have to buy a book. And the Gestapo said, all right, two minutes and you will be back because the shop is only on the corner of the road. So I ran out with that Bible and was hiding that Bible under the tomatoes of our neighbor so that it got out of the place, you see. When I came back, I checked on Father's bicycle, and it was there. And I said, oh, Father has come back. We are saved. When the Germans came, they instituted that famous Hail Hitler. Now, Hail Hitler was the greeting of all the children when they came into school. When the teacher came in, they had to go up and stretch their arm and say, Heil Hitler. When he got out of the class, they got on the feet, Heil Hitler. Now, a, something I would like to stress is that that Heil Hitler is a physical greeting. The hands up in class outside in the street like that. You will see Hitler once in a while like that, and then you see him again like that, you see? There were the two, but it was always physical. So it was hard to hide. It was not only the lips, it was also the hands. So even in street, when we met a teacher, we would have to hail, you see? He wouldn't look on our mouth, he would look on our hands. So I learned to be very careful and have my eyes everywhere, you know, not to get caught, because, as I believe, you could not hail a human man. Hail means salvation. And in my understanding of the Bible, only the Messiah, only a God-given Messiah could be hailed. Not the person could give hail to any man on earth and of course not to a monster like Hitler was. By that time I had read what was going on with Jehovah Witnesses in camp. I have seen people being arrested. I knew what kind of system that was through the teaching of evolution. How could I hail such a man and such an ideology? So I took my stand. Well, when they well, I should say in those days, the Catholic priest used to come to school to teach Catholic religion in school, during school hours. This is still going on in my home country. Oh, yes. And so when that man came in, in school, before the war, there was a cross in the classroom. Not a Catholic school, plain, state school had a cross. When Hitler came, they took the cross down and put Hitler on the place and the cross underneath. Well, when the priest came before Hitler, his greeting would be, blessed is the one that cometh in the name of uh, the Lord. As soon as Hitler came along, the priest went like this, Heil Hitler, blessed is the one that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the whole class would say, Heil Hitler, Amen. 
So this I have seen over and over and over again. Now when he came, I went out of class because I didn't want to take up that course and I had to stand outside and wait the whole hour. How were you able to conceal the, your feeling at that moment when the whole class... I was disgust. Disgust. And my feeling was hatred toward uh, this way of, uh, uh, of uh, what shall I say, uh, um, get a religious symbol down, crushed down under the, the feet of Hitler, you know? Because we don't use the cross as Jehovah Witness. This is just information for you. Jesus died on a, s a stake, not on a cross. The cross business is completely... Well, anyhow, but it still stands there for a religious symbol. And for them to have Hitler in f top of the greeting, in top of the image, in top of everything, and the Catholic Church did go with it. In the church you had the, 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 the um, what shall I say, the, uh, the flag inside the church. Well, they claimed they had to do that. Well, it's a matter of conscience, huh? You cannot force anybody who doesn't want to, that doesn't exist. Anyhow, I was standing outside and another German girl who was atheist was also out of that, you know, of that uh, teaching of that priest and two other girls. And we did not see a teacher coming by. We four girls were uh, laughing, you know, in a corner and playing, and uh, she came back and suddenly she turned around, put us on the wall, said, Heil Hitler, and three of them said, Heil Hitler, and I didn't. So she took me in front of the three other ones and greeted once more, Heil Hitler, and all three said, Heil Hitler, and I didn't. So she said, what's the matter? I said, I'm... A Christian, and in the Bible it is said, Heil belongs only to Christ. Nobody can be hailed on earth. Oh, she said, Bibel Forschung, I see. And she ran away, and she did not go to the school director, you know, the one who was responsible. She went across to the one who was responsible for the whole country, denouncing me. So this was on a Saturday. Monday when I came to school, my teacher called me up and he said, here is a paper. You have to go from class to class with this paper and have it read by the teacher and signed by the teacher. The classes were very large. In those days there were 45 children, double classes, because the uh, people were uh, in war, you know, teachers were in war. And it was a big place because there were boys and girls, not mixed. There were all together 38 classrooms I had to go through. So this took me the whole week. And you know what was written on that paper? It has been known that one of the children in school is rebellious against German peace, against German behavior. We give the following warning. By the end of this week, this person has to make a decision, submitting or leaving school, because we cannot allow a rebellious child to be in school. Underneath has to be brought from class to class by the child Simon Arnold. So I heard this 36 times a whole week. In the middle of the week my teacher said you come home with your mother. We went to his place the name of the teacher was Zipf. He was a Baptist. He talked with mother a long time and he said to me, look, I fully agree with you. 
I don't hail Hitler either. You look at me, you know, I do it with the left hand, not with the right. I don't give my support with the right hand. I do it with the left hand and I pray to God and said, you know, my heart belongs to you. This is just to keep my freedom. Do it like I do. I said, I can't. For me, it's a lie. I cannot lie. The Bible says you shouldn't lie. I, I cannot agree with it. Left or right hand, I do not want to hail. I went back to school. Well, I was under condemnation. Still was afraid mother would be taken away, you know. And then I was surprised. The girls had come back from camp and they all had turned against me. It just looked like I would have had the worst sickness in the world, you know, lepers. They just not even would touch me. I said, what's going on? Well, I knew two weeks of Nazi education, you know, with the songs and everything would make them come up for Germany, but not to that extent. But it just was such an atmosphere, you know. I said, oh, well, what's going on? Well, by uh, Wednesday, all the classes had to go, go to the schoolyard in square. In the middle was a pool with a flag. Well, the flag was not on it. The flag was folded on a cushion on the floor. I was hiding behind the tall girls. The, the director of the school was there. The principal, you say, was there. He said, where is Arnold? Get the Arnold child in front. So they took me, put me in the front, and I sneaked again a little bit back. I thought, everybody is like that, and I'm like that. Everybody's going to see it. Better be, uh, you know, got behind. He got up to the pool, and he said again to my teacher, where is Arnold? You put, put her ahead of everybody, alone. It's OK. They put me uh, about this distance. And I said, that's it. This is going to be the thing, you know, the heavy. So the boy came in, uh, you know, in the Hitler Youth with a flag. I put the flag up, you know, on that tree for Heil Hitler and Heil, 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 and then the national song and the, uh, the Horst Wessel song, you know, they had two songs. And all stretched out during the whole song, you know. I was standing like that, I got, you know, I almost felt like going into the earth, so heavy, so loaded, you know. And he went on with a big, big, big talk, saying that Germany is a country of freedom, and the country where each one can choose his uh, future, and uh, the education was the best one in the world. And, uh, some might not appreciate that, but that's the own choice, and you soon will have an example what happens to someone who does not submit to German rule. So in myself I said, I'm going to be beaten to pieces, you know. Well, the flag came down, three times see Kyle, all the thing over again, you know. And everybody departed, and I stood there all alone. And no man spoke to me, not the teacher, not the principal, no one. Just the same feeling of being like, you know, well, lepers. And I remember I went home with a funny feeling, uh, a feeling I didn't understand what had happened, you know. It had been very heavy on me. I had been trembling. 
at a certain moment, I remember I had been shaking there like a leaf, and suddenly I said, oh God, please give me the strength. I do not want to tremble in front of all those people. And right away I kept quiet. But in spite of that, I had the feeling something goes wrong. So when I came home, we had a long hall, a little table there, and there was a letter. I saw came up, I saw Simon Arnold. I opened the letter. It was my arrest for the following morning. My mother was not there. She was out on the balcony. She let me alone with the letter. I read that, that I had to be on the station the following morning. The room was open and on my bed were lying all my dresses, you know, and the luggage. And mother came, she took me in her arms, and she said, you know, Simon, you are now over 12 years old. This is the time when, in the higher society, children go away from home to go in boarding schools to be taught higher education. Now, you are going to have higher education. What you will learn is going to help you your whole life. So take it as an occasion to grow up. And in the afternoon she said, let's go to the city and buy some things you might need. And she bought me a little box with uh, tread and things, you know, to mend and hiding a Bible, a little Bible in there underneath. And she said, most probably you would be able to keep that, you know. All right. Anyhow, when we arrived in Konstanz, it still was raining. How long was the trip from, uh, from your Well, home? we left at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was uh, at what, 2 o'clock in the afternoon we had arrived. Those trains those days were very, uh, well, and fast, you know. The two ladies grasped me, and we walked over to the place, which was a house located between two border roads going over to Switzerland. And the property was alongside the border. It was a beautiful property. The history about the property is interesting. It is called the Wissenbergische Erziehungsanstalt. Wissenberg being the name of a man who lived in the same time as Pizzalozzi, who is the, von, uh, the one who had the foundation for orphan homes in Switzerland, still going on up to this day. And he was a priest, as well as Pestaluzzi was a bishop. And it was his private house, a house who was about 250 years old, with a beautiful flower garden in the entrance, roses, and beautifully well done. And when time came for him to die, he said that his property would not be turned into the Catholic Church, but to the city of Konstanz to make an orphan home. So this was, in the beginning, an orphan home. And an orphan home, which was built about 150 years ago, the setting inside, you know, the tables in wood and, and the bed were on a... a black uh, material, uh, what shall I say, uh, metal, metal beds, black metal beds, you know, and uh, inside a straw mattress, covered up, of course. It was like middle age. The whole setting was like middle age. Getting up, I should say, in the morning, we had to do our beds open window even in winter time go up and wash only the back and the face nothing else everything else was forbidden except on evenings the feet but everything else nothing absolutely nothing we got the panties changed once a week and if they were soiled the child didn't get anything to eat 
for a day or two. We had uh, the bed changed three times a year, the sheets. We had caps on on the head because of the greasy hair, because they get washed twice a year, one for Easter, one for, uh, for Christmas. It was like middle age. Everything was like middle age. But the worst of this all is that we had no right to talk to each other. I stayed two years without talking to anyone, except once. Now, this was a girl who was next to me. This girl, one evening, I was in a corner. Uh, my bed was in a corner. The other bed would go the opposite, you see. She was next to me. She said, I have the feeling you are here in this house for another reason than the other children. You have different behavior. So I started off talking about the Bible, my Bible teaching. And suddenly, Sophie was her name. She said, oh, I saw Hilda going down. Denunciation. Two minutes afterwards, Sophie, Maria, down. Okay, I went down. I never got punished for doing things wrong in Constance. My mother and uh, the friseur, the, the barber, Kurt Adolf, as well as Marcel Sutter, they always said, no, you be careful. Refusing to do something is not being stubborn. You make a difference between refusing something or getting stubborn. You are never stubborn. So I was very careful always to, to be as easygoing as possible. Well, that night I was in transgression because I talked. What did you talk about? Well, the Bible. The, the girl next to me was a Protestant. So she put a leather apron on. She took a rod. Uh, a soft rod. I don't know what it was made, but it was soft. Girl had to bring the hand forth. She was beating on her fingers. So strong that it went down on her knees. That's why she had a leather apron on. And she did that seven times on each hand. You couldn't see the fingers anymore. And then Sophie had to leave. I handed my hand. She started off beating me, and she looked in my face, and she said, your religion is always responsible for your troubles. When it comes about religion, you don't, you, you, you don't know anything else anymore than talk. She said, all right, I won't punish you today. But if it happens again, I catch up, it will be twice as much. So I went up to bed crying as much as the other one, of course, emotion, you know. But that was not all. A child who had gotten beaten on the hands, so many strokes, so many evenings without eating. We all ate together in a big dining room, and the child had to get up and say, Thank you, when the plate came into the soup, you know. Thank you, I have no right to eat because I'm punished. The child had to say that in order that everybody knew. And that meant seven evenings without food for Sophie. Now, when my plate, I was taller than Sophie, or elder, older. When my plate came up, I got on my feet and I said, thank you, I'm punished, I have no right to eat. And the teacher was so surprised, it was the director, she was so surprised, you know. She looked at me, she looked at Sophie and she said to Sophie, you come over here with your soup. I don't want to hear anything about that matter anymore. So she cancelled the punishment, you see? That's why I say she was she had a sense of justice in there, in the director heart. She was hot, 
harsh, you know, but there was still some justice in there. Well, at Sophie afterwards, once in the staircase, she said, I'm here already eight years, never saw that. I had to go under the bed every day to clean under, under there, lying on my belly, and I would have control, but the teacher who, who was in that room and would control me, she was a heavy type, and she had a hard time to go down her knees to see what I'm doing underneath. This gave me the chance to put my Bible just right back in the, in the, the springs. springs again. Thank you. So there I could do my Bible reading. And then on Sunday, the first Sunday in that place, the three Catholic present went to church and the 33 Protestant went also to their church and I was all by myself. So I asked the director, that elderly person, Frau Lederle, to read my Bible in schoolroom because we had the schoolroom right in the house and the children didn't go out of the property. So okay, I could read the Bible there on the first Sunday, but when the teacher came along, Messinger, who was 32 years old uh, approximately, she said, what's that kid doing over here? And she said, we do not want that. She has not to read her Bible. She goes to the kitchen and cooks for the whole house. So every Sunday morning, you saw Maria, because Simone was French, they couldn't call me Simone, they called me Maria. Uh, that Maria, there, I was so small, they had to put me on a little bench, you know, because the soup pot was very high, and I had to turn that heavy soup for the 37 children, because we had soup for them breakfast, we had soup on evening. And we had most of the time uh, some uh, potatoes at noon, uh, hardly any meat. The butter was used to make black market, you know. The teacher would sell it and tr turn it in for themselves, taking it away from the children. I had several times been called to take a big basket. There was butter in it, and then I sell it on top of it. I had to bring it to somebody in the town, so I know about what I'm speaking, you know, because I know where the butter went to. Uh, since they had confidence in me, being a witness, I could go out of the house in town to pay uh, uh, bills or to go to people and bring them something which came from the house, you see. So by a certain time, I could go out there in the city. And I had a set time. I had to be back in 20 minutes or half an hour according to the distance. And what I would do is run like mad in order to stay in line somewhere and listen what people were talking about the political situation of Germany. If they didn't talk about it, I ran to another place and tried to get the news to know where the, uh, the Allies were, how it went on Russia, just to get to grasp some news, you know, to find out if there is any possibility of soon being liberated.